Good morning, Providence. This is Psalm 58. To the choir master, according to Do Not Destroy, a mictum of David. Do you indeed decree what is right, you gods? Do you judge the children of man uprightly? No, in your hearts you devise wrongs. Your hands deal out violence on earth. The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray from birth, speaking lies. They have venom like the venom of a serpent, like the deaf adder that stops its ear so that it does not hear the voice of charmers or of the cunning enchanter. O oh God, break the teeth in their mouths. Tear out the fangs of the young lions, O oh Lord. Let them vanish like water that runs away. When he aims his arrows, let them be blunted. Let them be like the snail that dissolves into slime, like the stillborn child who never sees the sun. Sooner than your pots can feel the heat of thorns, whether green or ablaze, may he sweep them away. The righteous will rejoice when he sees the vengeance. He will bathe his feet in the blood of the wicked. Mankind will say, surely there is a reward for the righteous. Surely there is a God who judges on earth. This is God's word for God's people. You may be seated. Good morning, Providence. My name is Nate. Um, I get the privilege of serving here as one of your residents, and it's a joy to be with you this morning. Um, I, I wanted to take this opportunity to thank you guys. For those who are new or, or who don't know much about me, but I, I serve in the Air Force as a reserve chaplain. Yes. And I've been gone for the past 30 days, and I just want to thank you, the church, for loving on my family, right? We, th there's prayers, right? I got phone calls of encouragement, meals, right? Some of you watched my three kiddos, which I know it could be a challenge. And so I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart on behalf of Katie, myself, and the kids. Thank you for your loving us. Love you. And I'm so thrilled to be back and actually preach on Psalm 58. When I first got that psalm, I was just like, Thank you. Thank you, Jared and Andrew. I appreciate that. But, but the more that I've prayed into it and looked into it, it, it's a beautiful psalm, and I hope today that we'll be able to see that. We're going to actually do something kind of abnormal. I want you to look at this image. This was done by Luke Spafford, an amazing artist. And he, he showed me this image, and it just blew me away of, of what he just extracted the imagery, the symbols that he saw when he read through this psalm. And so we notice, we see the snake, right? We know who that is, right? The adversary, the father of all lies, right? And in, in his eyes, there's destruction, chaos, evilness, wickedness. And he leaves within his wake destruction, right? We see the village, the town, the castle on fire. But the best part of that is the centerpiece, right? The, the, the center of our life, Jesus, God, coming down to crush the serpent, right? To, to execute judgment on evil and wickedness. And I love, like, there's this aura around it of, of God's righteousness, of holiness, his purity, just this power. And just how images and symbols are meant to evoke emotions, right? To, to stir things that are inside of us. The Psalms too, that's what they reflect. They reflect man's soul of emotions and imagery and reflection. Some Psalms reflect gratitude and joy and hope. And they, and they give us the words to remind us that God is holy, that he is just, that he is faithful, and he is worthy of our praise. Other psalms paint a picture of sadness, grief, sorrow, and pain. And sometimes we feel them internally generated when we're dealing with our sin of a holy God. But, but also they can be externally driven from the outside at the hands of wickedness and evil people. And maybe in your life, you've suffered from the hands of evilness of something wicked. Or maybe you ask the question, where is justice? Well, Psalm 58 answers that question. And for us, we're going to see that this song is a judgment over the wicked. It's a poetic and illustrative work that we see God's love, his kindness, his mercy, but also his judgment. 
Today, we will see that the wickedness that exists, that wicked, true wickedness and evil does exist, that we can cry out to the Lord in face of that evil, that God is a God of justice, and that he does it perfectly and rightly in the, the Son of Jesus. And so if you would join me in prayer, and then we'll get into God's word. Uh, Heavenly Father, in light of this, the weightiness of this psalm, right, that we're going to be talking about some, some weighty issues, Lord. And so I just ask that you soften our hearts, Lord. That, that you soften our hearts to the, the full counsel of your word and to your nature, and that it provides hope, Lord, that, that we see you in a new light today that perhaps we haven't seen you before. And so I just pray all of these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. So we're going to begin this morning with David calling out a group of wicked men, right? These, these evil men. He's going to describe their character, and then he's going to pray judgment for them. But let us first consider the idea of real evil and how today evil exists. And so I recently came across this news article that was detailing women who were captured and assaulted by Boko Haram, right, this terrorist organization. And some of these women were rescued by a Nigerian military force. And then they found out that these women were pregnant, but they decided they wanted to keep the child. They said that the kid, the child did nothing wrong. Well, the Nigerian military forced these women to have an abortion against their will. Some of them were given pills, some were injected, some were dragged and beaten. Right? These women experienced evil on both sides, right, from those who use power to exert this pure evil. And if that doesn't stir something inside of you, let's make it a little bit worse, right? Imagine that that was someone you knew, right, a mother, a sister, a friend. Our first point today, and, and what David is going to reveal to us, is that wickedness that the wicked are out there enacting injustices. That the wicked are out there enacting injustices. So open your Bible to Psalm 58. We're going to start in verse 1 and 2. Do you indeed decree what is right, you gods? Do you judge the children of man uprightly? No. In your hearts, you devise wrongs. Your hands deal out violence on the earth. So here David is addressing these wicked leaders responsible for judging the, the affairs of men. Right? And he begins the psalm with a pair of rhetorical questions, right? Not meant to be asked, answered because we already know the answer. He's making a statement because in the next verse, he answers with an emphatic no, right? No, you do not decree what is right. You don't judge lawfully. Instead, what you do is you conspire, you who think you are gods. Right? Th these men are in power with King Saul, attempting to keep the throne away from David, attempting to keep David away because he's becoming a threat in their minds. And notice in verse 2, the movement from their hearts to their hands right? In your hearts, you devise wrong, right? They methodically consider their actions. They, they weighed their judgments and they convinced others that it was good. And as a result of their decrees, as a result of the wickedness of their hearts, their hands dealt out violence on the earth, right? David is examining the state of their heart and how it leads to brutality, Right, Saul, we can probably see an example in 1 Samuel of some of the atrocity that maybe David is thinking about. Maybe the violence that's actually being expressed, we can see in, in 1 Samuel 22. And so Saul, the, the quick story here, Saul is, is chasing down David. And David's kind of on a run. And he gets helped by a priest from this town near Jerusalem. 
And when Saul finds out, the king orders that 85 people to be killed, right? Men, women, children, and all the priests, all the animals. And David is informed of this. So David knows what happened. David knows that they were killed because he was helped. And then when I read that, I I wondered if, in part, is David now so outraged because for the first time, he's actually feeling the wickedness of men, right? Maybe this is the first time that David is actually feeling the sting from a group of men who are wicked, who have power, right? It could be easy for us to not consider injustices that don't reach home. It could be easy for us to not think about governments or wicked organizations or legal corruption illegal corruption until it personally hurts. And this is why we must pray for our leaders in civil organizations and in civil institutions. We must pray for those men who have the power to do wicked. We also must pray for the persecuted. We have brothers and sisters in Africa, Asia, the Middle East, South America, that are feeling the wrath of unjust, immoral men, right? Who are persecuted because they love Jesus. It's something that we don't have to, or we don't feel much of, right? That, that physical persecution right now. But they do. Evil, real evil exists. And the heart of the wicked lead to this injustice and the violence that we see. And so David calls out these flawed and wicked men spread in violence. And so we're going to see in verse 3 and 5 that David is going to describe them for us. He's, he's going to describe their nature. He's going to describe the power of the tongue to perpetuate these injustices. So read with me in verse 3. The wicked are estranged from the womb. Right? They go astray from birth speaking lies. They have venom like the venom of a serpent, like the deaf adder that stops its ears so that it does not hear the voice of charmers or the cunning enchanter. So notice in verse three how David is connecting the wickedness of these men, their their, their wicked actions to their nature. That their the, the wickedness is so deeply entrenched, right? So deeply rooted because from birth, they've gone astray, right? And, and the fruit of their character, if you notice, is their venom. And that venom attests to their nature. In verse four, David equates the words of these wicked men with venom of a snake, where they speak falsehoods, they, they pronounce lies, they have this venomous malice about them. And the imagery of the serpent speaks of evil. And their tongue flames this fire of violence. Right, you see that the cobra, as this verse is sometimes translated, the snake, the cobra, the adder, um, is this poisonous snake that, that ferociously lashes out at their victims. Right? They inject this cocktail of deadly toxins. And the venom of these men are lies and deceit. And it's important that we know the power of a lie, right? how words can be so deadly. Imagine for yourselves being a father in Jackson, Mississippi, right? watching your son beaten, lynched, and set on fire for a crime that he didn't commit. No trial, just execution. Or think about the propaganda machine that is easy to think of, the Nazi regime, right? They lied to their people, they lied to the world. Can you imagine being separated from your family, being told you'll see them again, but to realize that they were on the train that headed to the gas chamber? History shows us that the world is full of darkness. It's full of wicked men with wicked hearts who produce wicked actions. And they all spread them with this deadly poisonous bite, a lie. 
deceit. And this is what David is getting at when he, when he talks about the venomous words, they are provoking death and destruction. Notice how in verse four and five, no one's able to talk them out of it, right? They're, they're not gonna listen. No wisdom are gonna swell, sway these evil people. Like the deaf adder that stops its ears so that it does not hear the voice of charmers or of the cunning enchanter. Now, speaking to the Pharisees in John 8, Jesus says something similar, right? He, he talks to the Pharisees and says that they will not listen to him. And that they do not want to listen to his word. They, they don't want to listen to his truth. Now David is unjustly being persecuted. Those 85 men, women, and priests were unjustly murdered. It is these wicked men that are speaking lies. And it reminds me back to the John 8, where what did Jesus say to these uh, Pharisees? Do you remember? He says that you are of your father, the devil, right? And the truth isn't in you. These men were serpent-like, the devil. And David plead with them, but surely he would not, or if they're not listening to him, surely they're not going to follow the law. Surely they're not going to follow God's word. Right? They too have the character of the devil. And David is convinced. I'm actually convinced that David is convinced that it is only by the power of God that these wicked men will actually listen, right? Corrupt nature, they refuse to listen and they speak this poisonous. And sometimes it is only by God's judgment that anyone would ever hear. Now, if this is true, if, if God is the only one that can deal with these wicked men, this leads me to my second point, right? There is a God we can cry to it about. There is a God we can cry to about it. David is going to pray to God for judgment of these evil people. Right? And these are the verses that we're going to touch on that, that can be weighty and hard to hear. But just know they're motivated by this sense, sense of outrage Right, the, the, the sense of righteous outrage, I would say, of brutal men who spew their venom to the destruction of others. Injustices ought to provoke us to cry in the face of violence and this evilness. It should have us cry out to God to receive a response from the God of justice. So here in uh, verses 6 through 9, David's calling for judgment of the wicked in his day. Read with me. O oh God, break the teeth of their mouths. Tear out the fangs of the young lions, O oh Lord. Let them vanish like the water that runs away. Let, let, when he aims his arrows, let them be blunted. Let them be like the snail that dissolves into slime like the stillborn child who never sees the sun. Sooner than the pots can feel the heat of the thorns, whether green or ablaze, may he sweep them away. Again, this language can be tough to hear. But these wicked men who have no capacity for good, if, it is, if this is the case, and, and David is asking for God to take away their ability to do evil, right? David is crying to the Lord, break their teeth from their mouth, right? Blunt their arrows, O oh God. Dispose of them of their ability to oppress others, right? David wants the carnage to stop, and I don't blame him. But it's important that we take a pause in light of some of this language that we're hearing. Any woman or family that's lost a child, please, please, please hear that this is not judgment against you. That that experience that you had was not judgment. 
in this image that David is invoking, he's simply saying that it would be better for these wicked men to never have been born. And his call of judgment, right? David is saying, if there are those who are power or have power that use it for wicked, wicked, Lord, strip them of their ability to do it, right? Take it away. But if possible, it would be better for them to never have seen the sun. But if it were possible, he would rather them never see the sun. Right? This psalm should produce into us a sense of deep sorrow, right? For the, the, those who are oppressed, for those who've gone through pain and persecution. But it also should produce an outcry, right? For justice in the face of evil, right? David is seeking justice and he's turning to the only person, the, the only one who can provide it, right? The only one who can provide true justice that he seeks. Now, someone... For those who don't know, I was in the Marine Corps for about 12 years, right? And some of these images, as I was thinking through it, of potentially with my daughter or my kids or my wife, right? I, I, I was in the Marine Corps and I'm fully aware of the power and the might that a division of Marines, 22,000 Marines could bear down on some of these weak, wicked men, right? Some of these wicked organizations like Bo, 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 Boku Raham and uh, the Nazi regime, but then I thought, can I suggest to you that we have someone far greater, far powerful, far, far stronger and mighty than a division of Marines? We have the divine ruler and judge of the universe. And it, it, it dawned to me, what if we learn to pray? Right? What if this psalm is enlighten us, is, is encouraging us that we can pry, pray in the face of evil. Oh God of justice, when you see the wicked institutions, organizations, or just pure evil out there, what if we prayed, oh God, defang them, blunt their arrows, oh Lord, let, let them dissolve into slime, and let them be swept away as soon as the pot touches the flame. What if we could pray in light of that? And David's desire for God's justice, but, but he desires for God to demonstrate it, right? Instead of remaining apathetic to the evils in the world, would we not cry out to the Lord of justice, to the Lord of lords, to the, the, the king of the heaven? Oh, justice, oh, Lord. Would we depend on the Lord? Would we trust in him? Would we cry out to him? And this is where David takes us next. He, he points us to the fact that he is the God who brings judgment. God is the God who brings judgment. Begin in verse 10. The righteous will rejoice when he sees the vengeance. He will bathe his feet in the blood of the wicked. Mankind will say, surely there is a reward for the righteous. Surely there is a God who judges on earth. Church, how easy... Is it for us when we see justice or injustice that we want to say something about it? That we want to be the one to do something about it? To say what is needed to be done, to take it into our own hands. Did you notice that David never asked that? Right? David doesn't ask, Lord, give me the ability to execute judgment. Right? He, he didn't pray, God, allow Saul to come into my hands to deliver him into me. No, he's praying that God would execute judgment. 
Right, it's very important that we see in verse 10 that the righteous will rejoice when he sees the vengeance, right? Not my vengeance, not your vengeance, but God's holy vengeance. Right? It's the vengeance and justice and judgment that doesn't belong to us, but it belongs to God. And I'm, I just want to say I'm not saying that this does not mean that if someone attacks your family, that you cannot defend yourself. That's not what I'm saying. I think David is talking about the systematic injustices of wicked men using powers to oppress others. Well, what about the righteous who rejoice, right? Who are they? Well, Scripture indicates that the righteous are those who live by faith. Right? The, the righteous are those who first seek the kingdom of God. But the righteous are those who love God, who love his word and love his people. And the righteous will rejoice when they see the vengeance. Church, we can have confidence in God who will bring judgment. Right? There will be a day where there is no more Boko Haram. There is no more Nazi Germany. There is no more venomous, evil men who are spreading violence on the earth. And on that day, the righteous will rejoice. And this psalm is not about personal retribution or about suppressing the hurt that you have experienced. It's about knowing and recognizing that evil is real, that evil does exist, but that God will judge the wicked. And we can cry out to God in the face of this evil, on the onset of today, I mentioned that the wickedness, that wickedness does exist, that, that we can cry to the Lord, that God will be the one to judge evil, and that he does it perfectly and rightly in his son Jesus. So how is this perfectly and rightly done? Well, the answer is, it's done on the cross. Jesus bore the guilt the shame, the sin of everyone who would believe in him. Right? For those who are in Christ, let this psalm remind us, let this judgment in this psalm remind us of the wrath that was poured out onto Jesus for you and me. Right? Every ounce of it paid in full for those who believe in Jesus. For the unbeliever, Jesus reminds us that there is forgiveness found in him. Every wicked deed, every sin, big or small, must be paid for. Think of Paul, who terrorized the early church, right? Even saying of himself that he is the chief of sinners, right? The, the sinner of all sinners, yet by God's grace, his eyes were open to the glory of the creator. God says that he will come and judge the living and the dead. Right, this could be today, this could be tomorrow, this could be 60 years from now when you close your eyes for the last time and you take your last breath. Will you be one of the righteous ones covered in the blood of the lamb rejoicing in God's vengeance because regardless of the choices you make, regardless, all of mankind will surely say that there is a God who judges on earth. And so with that, would you pray with me? Uh, Heavenly Father, Lord, there was a lot of heaviness today in this scripture, Lord, in this word, and it provoked a lot of evilness that we see in the world today. And Lord, I just ask that you're with our hearts. Right? If, if there is a pain, a, a suffering of any type of evil that we've experienced, Lord, I just ask that you wrap your arms around us, fill us with your spirit, give us the love that you showed 
And Lord, I just ask that as we see Psalm 58, that, that we look at it in light of your entire character, that we would not be afraid of preaching the whole counsel of your word or the whole counsel of your nature, which is love and mercy and holiness and righteousness, but it is also judgment, Lord. And so we pray for those in the world that are experiencing persecution, that are experiencing the, the hands of wicked men. And we pray for the organizations, the civil leaders, those who have power to execute, Lord, that, that you change these, the hearts of those men or that you execute your justice and your judgment because you are a right God we love you, Lord. We thank you for your kindness and your mercy every day. We pray all these in Jesus', Jesus holy name. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures. He Oh